Hi there, welcome back. Welcome back to the channel and another video. And this time it's again something completely different. This is a, a break while I do all the work I need to do on the cabinet of the uh, Telefunken Opus 8, which is eh, taking a while. But um, I've just had a break and uh, some stuff arrived while I was away, so I decided to do this video. And this is an experiment. This is something I've been wanting to do for some time. I live in a part of Madeira which has, well, we're sort of over the hill from Funchal, and we only receive about three, four stations on FM fairly strongly where I am. Now, there are a lot more stations on Madeira, and usually, depending on the, I suppose, depending on the uh, atmospheric conditions, I can get stuff from the Canary Islands as well, as you may have seen on some of the radios I've restored. But I've wanted to build an antenna amplifier for FM for some time. I have uh, tried this with the, with the AM bands and I've built the Mini Whip, which has been absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Whether I got lucky in the location of it, I don't know. I'm not touching it. Uh, it's on the top of the building up here. I'm on the top floor of an apartment building and it's on the roof. Neighbors haven't complained yet. But this thing is amazing and I'm afraid to take it down and, and do anything to it because I might mess it up. But I wanted something similar for FM. Now that wouldn't be fair when I test the restoration of, F of FM because I really do want to know how well something is receiving. And how badly something, a station is coming through is sometimes a good indication of how good your receiver is or not. However, once I have got this thing working and I know that it's uh, aligned properly and everything else, I would like to get a stronger station on there. Recently, I was watching a video by a fellow YouTube creator called uh, Flux Condenser, and he does some pretty amazing stuff on there. He gets hold of some pretty amazing stuff. And I've never seen someone who gets hold of new old stock Heathkit kits. I don't know where he finds them, but he does. And he builds them and restores them and all sorts of stuff on, on his channel. It's one of the channels I do enjoy watching. And he had a tuner that he was testing, and he was testing it in a basement, I believe, where FM reception was very, very poor. He connected this antenna amplifier up the front, and suddenly everything came to life. It was, it was like a miracle, and I wanted that miracle for myself. Now, the device he was using is a commercial uh, antenna amplifier. I can't remember what the brand was or what model it was, but I'm not even sure that it's still sold. But I decided to check around and see what I could find in terms of circuitry to build one myself and to perhaps experiment with it. And then I remembered something. Years ago, years ago, I remembered seeing something like this in a magazine that I uh, subscribed to then. It was Elector. I'm sure you've, most of you have heard of it. They had a, an antenna booster. And I went looking for it. I didn't find it on Elector. Um, as an Electro article, I actually found it on a different channel, I'll link that below as well, where they describe this particular antenna booster. It uses two very interesting components. It's the same component, they use it twice. It's a four-channel JFET. Now, those things I've always enjoyed because you can control the gain by adjusting the, uh, the bias voltage or the, the fixed DC voltage on, on one of the gates. And they are very, very low noise. Now, according to the article, this thing has got incredible specs and quite a lot of gain. I think it's about 30 dBs of gain, 25 dBs of gain. So I wanted to build it and I decided to go ahead and do a version of it. I designed my own board and I sent away for those boards and they've arrived. And again, PCB Way came to the rescue. I want to thank them for sponsoring this video. I got these boards from them. They arrived while I was away, so it was nice to uh, be surprised when I came back. Furthermore, I had ordered the JFETs. I've actually found them in a company in Italy, I believe it was. That I, that bought, I had to buy about 10 of them, so I found the JFETs, which I thought were going to be difficult to find. They do have uh, um, SMD versions, but I found the original JFETs, so I decided to go ahead and build it and experiment, see how we get along. I've got to warn you, I'm sort of not sure just how good it's going to be because it involves winding coils. 
Now, everything I've done that involves winding coils without very specific coil formers or, you know, ferrite beads or things like that, I have not had very much luck with it. Usually they sort of work. So I, I can't tell you what to expect from this. However, I received the boards and I made a few changes to the article. I will show the design of the, of the schematic and I'll explain the schematic briefly. But I got my boards. It came out perfectly as usual. PCB way, thanks a lot. And I'm going to just now describe to you what it is that the circuit does, or what the circuit is, what it does, and how the board developed, and we'll take it from there. So here we go. As I mentioned, this is definitely not an original circuit. I don't want to take credit for something I did not do. But um, I've changed this somewhat because I wanted to make everything local. The other one, the original article, has a remote power supply and you have to send the, the supply, the 12 volts, through the coaxial cable. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, what we've got here is uh, the antenna is connected to this point. It goes through a 22 picofarad capacitor and it meets this coil, which is coil 1, which is 7 turns of 0.9 millimeter diameter wire uh, with an internal diameter of 5 millimeter, length of 10 millimeters. You wind it on, say, a drill bit, a 5 millimeter or 4.5 millimeter drill bit. Uh, you wind it and then you stretch it out to about 10 millimeters of length. There's a tap on turn 5, so you tap at 5 turns from ground. In other words, you go from here and you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, tap, 1, 2. That's your 7. Then you've got a little uh, trimmer capacitor across here. This is just to fine-tune the uh, reception. So this then gets fed to the source of this dual gate MOSFET. It's a BF965. It's sort of hard to find these days, but they still sell them. I found them uh, within a company from a company in Italy. I'll link that below. You're basically feeding it to the source. You fix bias the, um, the gates, and in this case, both gates. This thing is just being used as a sort of a buffer, and a low impedance buffer for the, for the antenna signal. And this is biased with um, this resistor and that resistor, so 1 16th of, well, in this case, 12 volts. So that gets, gets you a fixed uh, bias on here. And this is decoupled to ground. Remember, you're working with about 100 megahertz, so you've got to decouple for various frequencies. They've got two capacitors here, 100 nanofarad and 1 nanofarad, just to make sure that you decouple this properly. And then the signal comes out here. There's a ferrite bead that's providing the main supply with a capacitor to ground, basically just making sure that none of the um, RF gets back into the supply. This is your effective load. One of the wound coils, it's L2, seven turns of 0.9 millimeter wire with the same internal diameter, close wound. These are air coils. I'll show you that when I build it. I'll show you how I, I built those, uh, those coils, wound those coils. Signal then comes out here and you can tune it over here with this trimmer. And then it gets fed to the gate one of the second BF965. The gain of this stage is controlled by the DC voltage on uh, gate 2 and that is set by this uh, trimmer pot. You've got 100k and then 47k so it gives you a little bit of a range about one third if you think about it the maximum voltage here would be 47 divided by 147 times uh, the supply voltage. It'll be about 4 volts maximum but you can adjust that. This thing is uh, source bias, so you've got a bias resistor here with a bypass capacitor here and your signal, amplified signal, comes out here which you then can tune as well with this trimmer. And then through that very small 3.9 picofarad capacitor to the radio itself, this is the second coil, L3, which is the same as L2. And L4 is different. It's 30 turns of thinner wire 0.15 millimeter diameter, and it's wound on a 1 mega ohm 0.5 watt resistor, and this has to be a carbon resistor. So you're basically using the resistor as a coil former. Now 30 turns is actually quite a lot, so you've got to make sure you've got a big res biggish resistor so that these turns fit on there, and that's coil 4. These are just for decoupling, okay? 
and I'm feeding the supply straight onto here. I'm not putting this next to the antenna, so I don't need to send the DC along with the in the uh, in the coaxial cable to the antenna. And basically, that's it. What this does is it basically buffers the signal from here. It tunes it. You can tune the band or the, the span of frequencies that you that you want to uh, this thing to amplify on. You can tune it here and you can tune it there. You can also refine the tuning on the antenna circuit over here. So you can sort of shift the band of frequencies that this thing is going to amplify. And it should be sort of a bell curve, but with a fairly flat top of about, well, what I want is about uh, 12 megahertz. I want this thing to go from 88 to 100, which is uh, the frequency band of FM that these old German radios tend to have. If it goes a bit further, that'd be great, but I'm not sure just how sharp these coils or these uh, this tuning is going to be. This is, as I said, purely experimental. I want to see what comes from this, if this works, if I can tweak it, if I can modify it. Hell, if I even get it working the way the article says it works, I'll be happy, really happy. So I put this all in and designed the PC boards, Quite a bit of care was taken to make sure that the component layouts weren't crazy. Remember, you're working with RF, you're working with a fairly high frequency. Not that 100 megahertz is that high, but it's still respectable. So I've got a ground plane. This is a double-sided board. I've put the MOSFETs on the underside, okay, on the underside of the board. And everything else seems to make sense. I've tried to make sure that the coupling is in the right positions. I... I'm not sure just how good or bad this board is going to work, but we'll see. We'll see. I'll show you the 3D of this. But basically, this is it. You've got these trimmer caps, uh, the trimmer pot, which is the gain pot. And if we look on the other side, we would have the transistors here, except I don't have a 3D model for them. But this board is what I wanted, and I expect this is the result that I'm going to get. PCBWay is uh, sponsoring this video again, and so I ordered the boards from them. Let's see how this works out. Well, we'll start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start. And the first thing I did was um, I drilled two holes here. Now, why here? Well, on the board, you can see that the uh, FETs are on the underside. This is D1, that's D2. And the one thing I've noticed about the FETs is that uh, usually you drill a hole so they sort of go through the board because um, they've got an up and down thingy going on. So the idea is that you can fit this guy over here. And it actually fits into the hole. And I presume on the other side, you'll see the top coming out. This will probably, or well, this is probably intended so that you can get some uh, better heat dissipation. Not that this thing is going to, you know, draw much power or anything like that. The other thing is, I had quite a bit of difficulty finding the, um, the pinout for this. And the way I understand it is, you've got drain, source, I don't even know if you can see that there. But the source has got a little pin sticking out here. So drain, source, gate 1, gate 2. And you fit it like that on the underside. And I may have to cut the legs a little bit. They may be too long. They're allowed to be long as long as they don't touch anything that's not on that track. So that's the first thing. The other thing I need to do is to wind some coils. Now the coils, we've got a few. We've got um, coil L4 is actually just wound on a uh, carbon resistor. You use a half watt carbon resistor, an old one, doesn't matter, as long as it's got the right size and you have to wind uh, the right number of turns on there. Then you've got these uh, ferrite beads, that one there. Ferrite beads are just five turns on uh, a little bead and I'll show you that as well. You have these coils, there's one there, there's another one there. So there's a bit of winding to do and um, I'm not too familiar with uh, what sort of inductances you need on these coils. In fact, everything I read doesn't really tell you. What you need to do is uh, create a resonant circuit 
that resonates together with the uh, little trimmer capacitor, these guys over here, and they're supposed to resonate at the frequency band that you want. So I need to test this somehow. But there's various ways of doing it. One of them is trial and error. You tune to a station and you adjust the, um, the trimmers till you get the best boost. I'll get to that when we start setting this thing up. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start putting in the components. I may just do... No, nah, I'll do it all. I'll put in the components and I'll show you the coils when I get to doing them. We've done pretty good so far. We've got all the components here with the exception of the coils, the ferrite bead over there, and connectors, of course. And also, obviously, I haven't put in the transistors yet, the FETs. But I want to do this ferrite bead. And what is expected here is five turns on a little bead. And I'm not sure that this is the right one. I just took whatever I could find. And the wire is pretty thin. This is about, I don't know, a third of a millimeter. One. Hang on, I always get this wrong. Five turns, so that's one, two, three, four. Oh dear. Five. Okay, five turns. Try and get this thing looking a bit neater. This looks a mess. Let me do that off camera. All right, I think that's about it. This is loose. I might put a drop of wax or glue. I'm not sure whether it's supposed to be open or closed, but I'm putting them like this. We'll see how it goes. With a soldering iron, you can get rid of the enamel on the ends, put it through on the board, and that's ferrite bead one. There we go. I've tinned the ends. You can just, uh, with a soldering iron, when you put solder on there, the enamel melts away and it's tinned, ready to go on the board. I just dabbed a spot of uh, super glue on there and it looks good. Right, that one's done. Now we go to the coils. And here we have coil two and coil three. Now what it takes is seven turns of uh, enameled wire on a five millimeter diameter center. I used a, uh, a drill bit. So five millimeter diameter, seven turns, close wound, and then I tin the ends. And this is ready to go in as well. This is coil one, and this bug is a little bit, a little bit trickier. It's again using about 0.9 millimeter uh, wire. Seven turns, but on five, you have a tap. So one, two, three, four, five, tap, one, two, seven. And that's how you put that one in. And again, using a um, 4.5, was it five millimeter? I think this is 4.5 that I actually used uh, drill bit as a former. So let's put that one in. Okay, that took a while. In fact, what took longest was finding a carbon resistor. Now, let me recap this. This is a ferrite bead with five turns. They say 0.15 millimeter wire. I think the one I've got here is a bit uh, thicker than that, but that's fine. So five turns on a bead. That's uh, the ferrite bead one. Coil two and three, that one and that one, is seven turns of 0.9 millimeter wire wound on a five millimeter former, like a drill bit. And these are open air coils wound closely together. Coil one is seven turns with a break on five. So from ground up, you get five turns, a center tap or a tap, another two turns. So seven turns in all, and it's spread to about one centimeter length. That's that one. And now this one here, coil four, is 30 turns of very thin wire, 0.15 millimeter wire, 30 turns on a one mega ohm carbon resistor. Now it's important that it's a carbon resistor, not a metal film or anything like that, and that's in there. Now all we need to do is to solder the transistors in, which I'm going to do by just clipping a little bit of the ends off because they do seem to be a little bit long. When I bring this over here, they do seem to be a little bit long, so I'll just clip a little bit of the ends off and solder them in there. And then I think we're done. 
Good. Okay, we've got pretty far along as you can see. Uh, I've got it in this metal box. It's an old box from my um, guitar pedal days when I was messing around with those. I used to use these things for experimentation before, you know, committing it to a final enclosure. It's got a lid as well. And I put the uh, board in here with a couple of spaces on there, connected the BNCs. This is the antenna input. So from the antenna goes in here and this one goes to the radio. Now, I'm going to be testing this with a scope. I think this thing is expecting to see 50 ohms. I've connected a 47 ohm resistor across here just to load it properly when I connect the scope to that end. There's also a battery connector here and I'll explain why I put that here uh, in a moment. I can use this with a power supply or with a battery, with a 9 volt battery. I'm going to try it with a power supply first because I want to try it with 12 volts. This thing's only 9 obviously. Now everything is in here. This thing's been cleaned up of any flux, residue, so it's all proper. Now I've actually experimented with this outside of the enclosure. It was a disaster. I got a lot of oscillations. This thing was moving all over the place. So I decided to put it in here and I'm going to do the experiments all over again with this thing in the enclosure. What I have done is I've got one, two, three trimmer caps and one pot to adjust. I've made the appropriate holes on top here. So we know that this is the, this one here is the one from the antenna. This is to match or to uh, resonate with the, the antenna signal coming in. It resonates with this coil, the one with the setter tap, coil one. This one here is after the first uh, amplification stage, which is that FET over there. So you can trim that as well. This one here is the final output and you can trim that to resonate with that coil and that coil as well. And then you've got the trimmer pot, which basically adjusts the voltage at gate two of that FET and that adjusts the gain of that stage. So I've put everything more or less in the middle and I'm going to adjust this or connect a signal in here, look at it on the scope and see what we're getting. I'm just going to put one screw on here, keep it snug. And I think we're ready to test. Let me set that up. Okay, here we are. I'm using this signal generator, this monocore. It's a bit rough and ready. The um, dial is not very precise. I got it recently, haven't restored it yet, but it's working. It's producing uh, the signals I want. I've got it on band F, which is over here, which allows me to go from, what is it, 10 megahertz to 150. You can then go higher to 450 with the using uh, the harmonics, but I'm using the main band. So I want to set it about here, about 90 megahertz. I've got it on low. You can adjust the amplitude here. But let's look at the scope when I hit the power. I've hit the power and I'm getting something. Just drop the, or rather raise, sensitivity of the scope. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tune from 88, about there, I think that's about 88. Uh, it's a bit low, 88, and I'm going to tune it to 100. There's 100. Now 100 is the highest frequency that my these old radios tend to go to, and you can see it's actually working. Okay, now what I need to do is I'm going to maximize it for 94.5, and why 94.5? Because that is sort of where they normally set it as the middle of the band with these radios. Let's see, where are we? Uh, about there. Remember I told you this thing's not too precise? That's about 94, 94.5. Okay, drop that a bit. And I'm going to adjust the last one first the last trimmer cap first. I want to resonate this on 94.5 because I want the best reception. Whoa. Okay, that's going up nicely. There 
Here's a peak. It's definitely a peak. Okay? That's the first one. Second one, that's the trimmer variable, the uh, pot. So the next one is this one here. Ooh. Okay, drop the scope a bit more. There's a peak. Okay, and this one now is the antenna input. See if that makes any difference. Yeah, so all our coils are permitting um, tuning. Okay, that's on 94.6 or so. Okay, now watch what happens when I drop the frequency. What we've got there is about 168. Now this is all relative because I'm just getting relative amplitudes. This is 167 millivolts RMS. Now watch when I go to 88. If I go to 88, I have to change the scale. There's 88. That's down to 2.4 millivolts. That's a very, very sharp tuning that's happening there. Now if I go to 100, there's 100. That's at 4.8 millivolts. So you see, there's a huge difference between the peak and the ends. This thing is far too sharp. Um, let me go to the maximum again. That is 180 millivolts, for example. If I go to 90 millivolts, I'm at 95. I was at 94.5, I'm at 95.5. If I go the other way, I'm at 93.5. So this thing is so sharp, it's, it's got sort of two megahertz of bandwidth. This would be great if I wanted to tune into one very specific station. But what I really want to do is I want to amplify a whole band of about 10 megahertz up front. Or 12 megahertz actually, not two. So I am a little bit stumped. This um, trimmer pot, I'll show you. This thing just increases or decreases the gain. You can sort of see it going down. It's not important. That doesn't change the oscillation. It has nothing to do with the bandwidth. So there is one way of doing this, which is to sort of go to, I'm going from 88 to 100. So if I go to about 90, if I go to about 90, let's see, where is 90? That's about 90 megahertz, is it? That's about 90 megahertz. All right. If I go there and I peak it at 90, let's say I peak this last trimmer at 90. Okay, I peak that at 90. Now I go to the, just below the 100, quarter 98. There's 98, and I trim the second trimmer here, or the, the one just after the first amp. Okay, now if I go to 100, still drops, but doesn't drop that much. And if I go back, it gives me a double peak, and then it's down to 88. So I can actually stagger tune these things, which is probably an idea. But I've got a feeling there's something wrong with this. It shouldn't be that sharp. And I don't really, I'm not too experienced with um, these RF circuits. This, it's been a long time since I studied these things at Varsity. And with, with not, no, not using it, what happens is you just forget how to um, lower the Q of the circuits. Now I'm sure that this can be done. 
even if the gain gets dropped. Uh, I'm sure the gain will be affected by this. But what I can do is I can actually hear the difference when I connect this to the radio, and I will be doing that in a second. So as I said, I'm a little bit stumped. At the moment, I've staggered tuned it. Yep, okay, so we've got a couple of peaks. One is higher than the other, I notice. That one's higher than that one, but then it starts going down really fast. That's about the highest, and that's on 97, 98. So I can stagger tune them. In other words, I tune the first one to a high frequency, and I tune the second one to a low frequency, and then those two sort of average out, instead of having a very sharp curve that I've tuned to. That seems to help, at least with the with the signal generator as the uh, source. Now I'm going to connect this to the radio and see if we can actually notice any difference. Let's see what happens. Okay, so here we go. The usual stations that I pick up quite well are this one. No change, because I don't expect it. It's a very strong station. There's another one down here. No change, perfect reception. Perfect reception, no problem at all, right? Now what happens, there's something else that I want to show you here though. Listen to this. You hear that? Now this is what really got me. Watch what happens when I switch off the power supply and I put a battery on. Completely gone. So my power supply makes a noise. Now I didn't expect that from what is a very good power supply. It's a Siglent uh, SPD 3303 and it's actually introducing noise. That's why I put that battery connector on there. So at the moment, this thing's on battery and it still works. Perfect reception there as expected. Now if I go to a station that I know is weak, this one here, there's one on 92, which I usually can hardly receive. Now I'm going to try and maximize it to that frequency. That's certainly improving. Well, see, that does make a difference. That makes quite a difference. I'm actually surprised. But what has it done to the others? Well, that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. I wasn't picking up anything here. I usually get something here, but I'm not sure if that's stronger or not. I'm hearing things that I didn't hear before. That's the one that's normally strong anyway, at 99 point something. And this one seems to be weaker than it was. Now, what if I try and peak that one? Let's see what happens now. Mm. 
No, not very good. Let's try this as it's on about 96.5. Well, there we go. It's made a bit of a difference. That 92 is not that strong anymore. Okay, folks, this is what I want to say. I am not sure that this thing is working as it should. I'm getting a far too tight a band. When it does improve a station, it is very specific to a very short or very small band there. I can actually go to any radio station here and improve slightly the reception for that particular one, but then I throw off all the others. Not that the others get weaker, they just don't get amplified. So this thing doesn't seem to be doing a wide band of amplification which means I need some ideas. This is not a do or die project. This was just a bit of an experimentation, as I mentioned earlier. I'm curious. I would like to have a, a bit of a booster because where I am, as I said, again, I get one, two, three, maybe four good stations. There's one other one, which is at 101.6, which on these radios I can't get unless I stretch the, uh, the band, which I don't want to do on this guy. So I would like to be able to amplify the, uh, the FM signal. I'm not sure just how useful that's going to be, if it's going to amplify more noise than signal. I really, really welcome your comments and suggestions and ideas. And um, depending on what comes back, I might uh, take this up again and try and improve it. With your help. <laughs> who said I'm the one who does all the work? So I want to thank you for your company. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have, click like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon. Links are below and at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.